All right, Alexander, let's uh, do an update as to what's going on in Ukraine. Um, I don't know if you want to give an update what's going on on the ground, and then we can talk about the uh, the meeting in uh, in Russia with the uh, the defense ministry, defense officials, and just hundreds of uh, members of uh, of government and the military, and just a huge a huge turnout to discuss. The military future of Russia, and we've had more meetings after that. So we've just got a lot of a lot of stuff to get through. Statements from Shoigu, from Putin, uh, expanding Russia's military, um, all kinds of things. So absolutely, absolutely. I will. You know, but to... let's 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 just talk about this. I mean, the last couple of hours, I think, partly because it's been so overshadowed by the events in Moscow, which let me say, are of epochal importance. <laughs> and we'll come to that shortly. Um, um, the, we haven't perhaps been getting as much focus or attention on the events in the battlefields. But it's now absolutely clear that Zelensky going to Bakhmut, if he really did go to Bakhmut, he supposedly went there. He you know, had a kind of photo op there. I assume he did go to Bakhmut, but uh, Alex is shaking his head. Who knows? But anyway, regardless, he came to Congress, talked about the heroic defense of Bakhmut. It was the centerpiece of his speech. And it's now absolutely clear that the Ukrainians are making their a last stand there. They're apparently being, building trenches in the center of the town. They're turning some of the apartment buildings into fortified places. They're putting, um, you know, man pads on the roofs. They seem to be determined to hold out to the very bitter end, even as the Russians are now closing in on a place called Ivanivka, which it, once it's taken, I mean, the ring is closed. And Kadyrov, who is the Chechen chief, says that Ukrainian resistance in Solidar is collapsing as well. That's another big suburb of Bakhmut. Now, I have to say, this is extraordinary to my mind, and it does make me wonder whether, you know, the last stand for Bakhmut, you know, the Ukraine giving so much of itself to try to defend Bakhmut, isn't because the Ukrainians at some level sense that if they lose there, if they lose Bakhmut, then the war itself in the end is lost because Donbass is lost. And once Donbass is lost, everything else is lost as well. But that that seems to me to be the position at the moment. And if you want my own personal view, I think that Zelensky went to Washington. He was hoping for a lot more than he got. He got one Patriot missile system, which um, Putin has just been scoffing at says it's you know they can they can whack it without any problems this is what click on it i think is what putin said so i i think that he was he you know that they, they, they are it seems to me pretty intent on making a fight for bachmut and it's looks like it's going to be the most important battle in this war okay um yeah mm. Want to get to the what's what's going on in in Moscow and and uh, yeah and with the I military. Mean, the pace of decision making in Moscow here is has been intense. So we had a on the twenty first of December we had first a national a Security Council meeting. This is the top political leadership of Russia. Then we had this colossal meeting of the board or collegium of the Russian Ministry of Defense. That's the entire Russian military leadership. 15,000 people apparently were involved at various levels. We had reports from Putin. We've had reports from the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. The following day, we had uh, uh, a report from the chief of the Russian general staff, Valery Gerasimov. He briefed foreign minister. Uh, foreign military attaches in Moscow, and we've had another press conference from Putin. And you can put this all together, and a number of things come across. Putin says again, 
he said this now several times, that the West's objective is to br destroy Russia, to dismember it, that Russia, therefore, is in a state of confrontation with the West. This is going to be an enduring and long-lasting one. And the Russians, therefore, have been pushed into a position where they have no choice but to remilitarize. And this is going to be a military build-up on an enormous scale. Um, another half a million men joining the Russian army, uh, 10 motorized rifle divisions being created. This is, you know, three are completely new. Seven will be developed out of uh, brigades. There's going to be more emphasis on strategic weapons, more emphasis on the air force, but the priority is now going to be the ground forces. As I said, 10 motorized infantry divisions, uh, two new military districts in Moscow and in the Leningrad region, that's the area that surrounds St. Petersburg, a new army corps to be created opposite Finland in Karelia. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the beefing up of uh, Russian tank divisions and, you know, tank forces. And this wasn't fully spelled out. Um, a massive expansion of the Russian army, two more air assault divisions. Now, the Soviet Union had seven paratroop divisions. Russia is now going to have six, but supplementing those six paratroop divisions there's going to be all kinds of um, independent air mobile brigades and all that kind of same thing so ultimately russia's airborne forces will probably outnumber those which the soviet union deployed and five naval infantry divisions replacing naval infantry brigades and the other thing was an enormous increase in Russian military production. And Putin is talking about the fact that military production increased very significantly in 2022, but that it's going to increase by orders of magnitude in 2023 and beyond. And he said, we have the financial resources to do it. Our economy is in good shape. We're fully capable of doing this. We don't need to do what the Soviet Union did, which is militarize our entire society and militarize our entire economy because we have the resources, we have the factories, we have the scientists, we have the engineers, we have the laboratories, we have all of these things, and we have the production facilities going as well. So the West is now in an arms race in Europe. It's going to face... Uh, a Russian military juggernaut, which is heading its direction, because that's be absolutely clear what's coming, and it's going to squash Ukraine in its path. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, there's going to be a war between NATO and Russia. That's pretty well, much what's, what's going to happen? Well, this Maybe is this after is what Ukraine. Who knows yeah. how long after Ukraine? But I mean, there, there, well, there is no other option. No. Either NATO, either NATO dissolves and the European Union breaks up, or there's a conflict. And the reason that Russia is building up their forces around Moscow and uh, Saint Petersburg is obvious. I mean, Saint Petersburg, they're they're uh, they're preventing what what could be uh, a threat from Finland. That's obvious, and then and all of these states over there in Moscow, the same. I mean, there, that would be the only reason to, to do all these things. No, I mean, but it's, the, the, it, NATO, there, there, is no, there is no other course for NATO. That's, that's my point. There is no other course for NATO. Well, because what is, if NATO stops, if NATO, if NATO stops in Ukraine, then there is no need for NATO. So NATO has to continue to push towards Russia. Where else is it going to push towards? Latin America? Well, towards yeah. the Pacific? <laughs> it has to push towards Russia. Well, that's, that's it. Well, there is a more practical problem, which is perhaps the one that really is going to worry the uh, Pentagon especially, which is that we have a overcommitments crisis. Now, I've been reading articles. There was an article, very interesting article in The Guardian, which I shared with you, which said, you know, we can only send one Patriot missile battery to Ukraine, and we've got to worry about, you know, the Ukrainians mustn't use too many Patriot missiles because we don't have enough. <laughs> We're already short of these things. We don't have enough weapons. 
to confront China and to confront, you know, Iran. We have, we're too thinly stretched in too many places. And you're hearing this all the time from source after source after source. Now, they've been able to keep things together up to now because, well, the Russians scaled down their military to a huge extent after the end of the Cold War with the Russian military now building up again and, as I said, moving through Ukraine ever closer now to, you know, the old Soviet borders because, be very clear, it's clear to me that that is what is going to happen and they're going to integrate Ukraine's current resources into their own. I mean, three of these divisions are going to be based in Zaporozhye and Kherson region which bear in mind the Russians are already talking about now, well, with regard already now as part of their own country. Well, with all of this, what does NATO do? Because they're facing this military juggernaut coming at them from the east, which they provoked into existence by pushing NATO eastwards all the time. And, of course, they have this massive Chinese build-up now in the Pacific, which is gearing up and getting stronger all the time. Now, I in before the Ukraine conflict began, I did a number of programs on my channel talking about this commitments crisis that NATO has and the US has, and it's just got massively worse. So what do they do? Do they do what you said, go for broke, <laughs> try and take on the Russians fast, before this Russian build-up is completed. That was what happened, to a great extent, at the start of the First World War. The um, Russians, in the period just before the First World War, started a major rearmament and military build-up program because they began to perceive a threat from Germany. By 1920, they would have been superior in pretty much every you know, military element to Germany. So the Germans panicked, and instead of seeking peace with the Russians, they rushed into war with the Russians instead in 1914. It's partly my take, but it's one that a lot of academic historians have. That's what started the First World War, German panic about the growth of Russian military power. Do we do the same? After all, that ended in disaster for the Germans. And, of course, today we have nuclear weapons thrown in. Or do we seek peace? <laughs> I mean, you know, the choice is ours. You ask me whether people in Washington are able to, to seek peace. I don't know. I mean, I don't see any sign of it at the moment. But that is the, that is the dilemma we're going to be facing in the West before very long. Well, look, NATO is going to seek expansion and its existence. I mean, NATO's goal is to exist. That's oh, absolutely. And absolutely. In order to exist, it has to expand. If it stops expanding, there's no use for NATO. The same for the European Union. I mean, they're both together. The European Union, that union has yeah. to expand. Otherwise, if but, it doesn't expand, but, you know, but there's, this, there, there's but this no is utility the, to it. So, I mean, but the, yeah. But there, this is the problem. There, but this there is, is the no problem other, now. But this is the problem now, because the Russians are now taking moves to stop NATO expansion in its tracks. And NATO's problem is not going to be to just go on expanding, even though that's the logic of what it is all about. You're absolutely right, and the EU as well. It's got to now, they've now got to start thinking, in effect, about defending that which they already have. And that's going to look increasingly difficult, because as I said, you have a Russian juggernaut coming towards you at the same time that the Chinese colossus is building up. How do you counter this at the same time? Can you build up armed forces in Europe big enough to counter the Russians at the same time as you're running up against a race with the Chinese in the Pacific? And you, talk, you mentioned NATO expansion. The point is, that the Russians are now taking steps to stop it in its tracks. All right, they might get in Finland and Sweden, 
Not that that will add anything much. Turkey is already debating whether it wants to remain part of NATO at all. I did a, a you know a program about this. There was an article in uh, Turkish newspapers. The, you know they're they're, they're now sceptical about NATO. They're starting to say really rude things about Zelensky, about Ukraine, about the U.S. They can't be counted upon in a war with the Russians, even if. They do decide for their own interests that they'll stick with NATO because, well, they make money out of it. That's basically all there is to it where Turkey's concerned. So what does the West do? Does it try to hold on to what it's got and build up its forces in Europe and perhaps neglect its forces in the Pacific? Does it go for broke by doing what you said, try to preempt this Russian buildup? But remember, they're already having um, weapons and am ammunition shortage problems. Or do they eventually face reality as they did in the 60s and say to themselves, this has gone further than it can. Our resources are now stretched to breaking point. Um, we can't continue as we have been. Problem is that in the 1960s, there weren't the neocons, and today there are. I don't know where this is going, but the events in Moscow over the last couple of days have shown that the Russians have finally decided that confrontation with the West is here to stay. It is inevitable. Putin talked about this at length. So did other Russian officials. Many of them were citing the fact that Merkel's, you know, Merkel's interviews with Die Zeit and the rest uh, were saying that you know the West can't be trusted anymore, that it's seeking Russia's destruction, and so we're going to. Uh, they, they're now embarked upon this enormous build-up. By the way, just just to clarify, the military districts, the creation of military districts, is not intended to provide you know fortifications around Moscow. St. Petersburg is different. It's intended to make it easier to raise troops in Moscow, to, in other words, build up reserve armies such as the Soviet Union used to have in Moscow, where, of course, the Soviet Union also operated a military district around Moscow. But it's a major sign of a build-up coming. Yeah, well, okay. Um, the neocons are not going to seek peace. They're not going to come to no. any realization. No. They're going to go for broke. I mean... That's obvious. So they're going to, to ramp things up. They're going to try to extend the war out in Ukraine as much as they can. Yeah. They're going to try to drag it on as much as they can to the last Ukrainian. They're going to try to inflict as much damage to Russia as they can. They've already said yeah. that their goal is to try and get some sort of regime change in Russia. And yeah. that would give them an outright victory. So uh, they're yeah. going to do that. And at the same time, uh, Russia is building up, but the collective West is also going to build up. Where they're going to well, try. Okay, Europe is broke and bankrupt. The United States is uh, is a mess as well. But they, but it does have uh, capabilities, and it is going to try to build up. Um, Poland is going to to put three hundred thousand people in. Poland. Yeah, absolutely, I absolutely. Mean, but th th this is going to happen, and that's why and that's why oh, they're doing yeah. it, and, and yes. they're doing it because I mean, people say that's a defensive three hundred. That's that's a def that's a uh, that, that's in defense yeah. of what's going yeah. on in Belarus. It's not a defensive force going on. It's not a defensive force. No. This is this no. is all part of uh, of the build yep. up to to do what the neocons are. are, yep. are but but all, the only choice of the neocons and the only choice of the West, which is it's not yep. the only choice, but in their minds, it's the only choice, which is to go uh, hard into into Russia. Yes, I mean I, I, and they, I they've should, said that's their plan. Yep. They, they've Absolutely. said this well, is their plan, so is there's well, no... Well, no, and the yeah. dismembering Russia and all that. And Kissinger recently yeah, has yeah, warned them against it. it. But, you know, I, I accept it. They are going to try to build up, no question about it, problems they have. And this is the, this is the, the key difference with the Cold War. In the Cold War, they were only up against the Russians. Now they have problems in the Pacific as well. You see the Russians and the Chinese coordinating. Medvedev just been to China. Um, there's talk now that there's going to be another meeting between Xi Jinping and Putin. The Chinese are angry over Taiwan. There's a naval program, a big Chinese naval program. Chinese are building up their missile forces. 
it's not so simple anymore. You can't outspend and outproduce the Russians in the way that you once could because the Russians aren't alone. <laughs> there are other threats and challenges to the United States in all sorts of places. Now, regime change is the other thing because, of course, the West has banked heavily on regime change in Russia. The crisis in Ukraine was, to my mind, entirely predicated on the assumption that there would be some kind of color revolution in Russia, that the sanctions would knock the Russian leadership off balance, that the people would rise up because they, they would face a collapsing economy and exploding prices and things of that kind. It's turned out entirely otherwise. But a major part of the speeches that were made over the last couple of days both Putin's speech at the military collegium and at his press conference, and also, by the way, comments made by other Russian officials, is that the Russians are now going to finally stamp out what they see as agents of Western influence in their own countries. And Putin was talking about the fact that some of these had been inserted way back in Soviet times even in universities. Clearly, he's talking about universities. So we're going to see a major effort by the Russians now to clamp down on all that kind of activity as well, making, I'm going to guess, regime change in Russia all but impossible. So what are the, what are the neocons going to do? Because Russia is a problem, but we come back to this. The main big challenge for the United States, for the West, isn't, isn't Russia. It's China. China's a much bigger co economy, far bigger economy than Russia is, Could potentially a far bigger military than Russia has. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to try and knock out the Russians now? Your your time limits are small, and I know, well, wait, but I mean, you know, you've already tried with Ukraine. Um, General Austin, you remember he was, you know, Austin and Blinken went to uh, Kiev and they came away and they were saying that they were going to weaken Russia. So weakening Russia, <laughs> their economy has stabilized. It's growing. It's going to start growing again. And they're embarking on a massive military buildup. It's achieving the opposite of what the neocons have intended to do. So, so what do you do? <laughs> But not what the neocons, I mean, no. it's another thing to, to say what the neocons intended to do, you on the outside yeah, looking I in. Know. I'm speaking as, as oh, a yeah. neocon, how they're thinking yeah. of it. Oh, yeah. And the neocons are not thinking like this. I think the no. neocons are thinking, we have to take out Russia, because that's yeah. the plan. We take out Russia, yeah. then go to China. And once again, they've said this. They've, they've, oh, they've yeah. said this on oh, multiple yeah. occasions. Yeah. We have to knock out Russia, then we can get to China. And the way we're going to do it is by going in hard and fast. Yes, I mean that this is this is what they, they want. Yeah. Lindsey Graham was was talking about just just the other day. Yeah, we have to get regime change in Russia. We have to provide Ukraine with drones and missiles, and oh, yeah. and the ability to, to go on the offensive, and the ability to attack Russia, and the ability to, to take back Crimea. Yeah, this this is how the neocons are are operating. And, oh, absolutely. You know, their their mind is is is. Yeah. We got to do it. This is our chance. This is their mind thinking. Yes. This yes. is our chance. They don't yes. see themselves as losing. Yes. They say this is our opportunity. Yes. Using yes. Ukraine, using Romania and Poland and the Baltic states and yes. and the weak yes. leadership at the EU and, and Europe. Yes. This is our chance to finally dispose of Putin to break up Russia and then. We've got a clear pathway to China, a clear pathway. This yes. is how they're seeing it. Yeah, now I, I understand that. Now, I'm going to say straight away, I mean, again, I was reading all the comments that the Russian leaders have been making over the last couple of days. My, my overwhelming impression is that they're confident that whatever the West throws at them in Ukraine, they can take it. And there's been a big article, by the way, on the RUSI website. That's the Royal United Services Institute website by Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vershinin, who is a logistics and military expert. And he says the same, that 
whatever you send to Ukraine, Patriot missiles, HIMARS missiles, uh, um, uh, tanks, drones, whatever it is, it, it's not in the end going to make any difference. And I agree with him. The only thing that can potentially make a difference is not sending in Polish troops who will be chewed up in exactly the same way as Ukrainian troops will be. It will be sending in Western troops, German, French, British, American. Now, is that what the Ukraine, what the neocons American. are going to do? American, American, American. American. Amer German troops are not going to make a difference. Well, no, they're not going American. to make a difference. American, okay. uh, American, the, yeah. American, American. American troops. Yeah. Now, yeah. is that is that where the neocons are going to take the US? Now, bear in mind that Biden himself right at the start of this conflict, says that in any situation where Americans, American soldiers are fighting Russian soldiers, you are in World War Three. <laughs> now, is that what the neocons are going to do? I mean, you know, the, I, you know, the, the I, US I, is I not going to do it. The US, the Pentagon, yes. no, the Pentagon is not going to, I believe the Pentagon I, is not going to allow agree. it. But the neocons, yes, would like that. I mean, the, yes, that, yes, yes. for the neocons, well, that's fine. Absolutely. But you see the trap that the neocons are leading the U.S. into. And I think this is the key point, because we've talked in many programs about the depletion of Western weapon systems. We've now seen article after article in the technical press. Vashinin talks about this as well, by the way, that it's not going to be possible to crank up weapons production anytime soon to the necessary levels to match this Russian build-up. The Russians will be starting to build up their weapons production. They've already started it in 2022. They'll do it much more in 2023. We are at least five, perhaps even 10 years behind. Perhaps we'll never manage it. Perhaps the financial costs of doing it are beyond what we can, our, our capacity to repair. But what the neocons are probably going to do is that they're going to do all the things that you were talking about. They're going to say, let's give them the Atakams systems to attack deep into Russia. Let's give them drones. Let's give them fighter jets. Let's give them more Patriot missiles. Let's give them more HIMARS missiles. Let's give them tanks. Let's give, us, let's give them all those things. And up to now, the neocons have been successful, not in getting everything that they wanted to Ukraine, but they managed to get a lot more to Ukraine than the Pentagon, I think, was happy with and was prepared to agree to right at the start of the conflict because they have the backing of the neocons have the backing of the White House and the National Security Council and the think tanks and all kinds of other people. But if they start throwing in tanks, throwing in infantry fighting vehicles, throwing in drones, all of these things into Ukraine, and they all get chewed up in the way that Putin was talking about, saying, and the other Russian leaders were saying, and the way that other people in the West also think, then what are we doing? We are depleting Western weapon stocks as the perhaps really big challenge in the East comes from China. And we're not even succeeding with the Russians. <laughs> so ultimately, the only way to stop this thing is to send American troops in. That's where the escalation has to go. It's the only, it's the only way you can do it. Now, I think and I am sure that eventually that demand will be made that you were going to see some people in Washington, and there are already people in London, by the way, who are saying that there have to be Western boots on the ground in Ukraine. I mean, there's a journalist called Simon Tisdall who's been pushing for this all the time, for example, in London. And I, I'm sure that there are lots of others who think the same way as he does. Boris Johnson, the way he talks, you get the same impression. Now, the big question is, when we get to that point, because that's where all this is leading to, what is going to happen in the United States? You said the Pentagon will put his foot down and say no. Well, I think you're right, but it's going to be a close run thing.
Well, it depends on who's... I mean, this may drag on till 2023, 2024. I mean, you know, this, this could yeah. be a while. So it also depends on who's in power in, Absolutely. in the U.S. But the, the risk that the Russians take... Yeah. And there is a risk that the Russians take by prolonging this this conflict. And I think the strategy is correct to that they're taking, which is to go slow and yeah. to grind down the Ukraine military. I mean that, that that seems to be the correct strategy. You can see the Russians yeah. aren't, you know, going, you know, full speed ahead all the way to, to the to the border with Poland. But uh, they're they're focusing on the Donbass and they're focusing on Bakhmut and they're taking things one step at a time and that is the right um, strategy. But but the risk is is that the more this drags on, the more of an opportunity you provide to the neocons to get to the point where they can make that ask and say, "We want American troops in Ukraine." This this is the way we this is the way for us to achieve victory. Yes. This is this is what whatever it takes means when they say whatever yes. it takes. Yes. That's what that's what it means. Everyone asks. Yes. Tucker Carlson yes. the other day asked, what does it mean, whatever it takes? Well, I'm going to answer your question, Tucker, if you're watching this video. Whatever it takes means American boots on True. the ground on the in ground. Ukraine. That's what the neocons mean by that. Yes. And yes. and on the flip side, they, Russia does run the risk of, of um, yeah. opening up or at least let, – let me, let me rephrase that. As the war is extended, there is a risk to Ru- to the Putin government, to Russia, that that the the neocons manage to to sneak in some sort of uh, of unrest or some sort of yeah. regime change. I'm not saying yeah. that's what's going to happen. I'm not saying that's successful. But once mm. again, the more you, the more of a, of a window yeah. you open up, the more of a time window yeah. you open up. It's yeah, you you give the neocons a way to yes. to maneuver yes. using the American embassy, using other NGOs. So it's a good thing that the Kremlin has identified that they need to absolutely get rid of all of these NGOs and these U.S. universities and God knows what else is yeah. is inside of Russia that operates. On the behalf of uh, of the deep state in the U.S., they have to absolutely get rid of all of that stuff. Yeah, get rid yeah. of all of it. But you yeah. know, the more this conflict is extended, the more you run that risk because you know, providing the long range missiles and all in the drones, it's not about Ukraine achieving a military no. victory over Russia. It's about creating chaos. It's about creating doubt in Putin. It's about you know, sowing unrest. Um, it's, it's about all of these things, yeah. chipping away at his popularity. The, the, this, is, this is why they attack Belgorod. This is why they attack Donetsk City. This is why they, they take out the Kerch Bridge. That's why yeah. they want these weapons. That's why they want to hit inside of Russia, yeah. the deeper yeah. the strike inside of Russia, the, yeah. more, the more doubt in their minds. They say yeah. we can sow some, some doubt and some fear inside of Russia and there's going to be some... There'll be someone in the Kremlin somewhere who's yeah. going to say, "Okay, everybody, that's enough. We have to take power because, yeah. you know, the, the, they took out the Kerch Bridge in, in Crimea. So, you know, this guy Putin, he's not protecting the country, or something like that. Yes. This is this yes. is what they have going on in their heads. I'm yes. saying that's no, I, I understand you know, that. As, I, as you go yeah. slow, as you go slow, which yeah. is the right approach. I agree with the approach. From what I know, it, it seems like it's the right way to go yeah. about things. But as you go slow, you do open up um, opportunities yes. for the, the neocons. I mean, I, I also think it is the right approach. And the reason I think I say that is because I'm not a military person, but I've been reading more and more military people. Um, Scott Ritter thinks it's the right approach. He's a military person. Lieutenant Colonel Vashinin, in writing for the Royal United Services Institute, also thinks it's the right approach, that it's a Brian winning Berlick, strategy. So. Brian Balletic. <laughs> Douglas McGregor, all of these people, they see it as the right approach. And they are people with a military background. So I'm not going to argue with this, but I completely agree with the identification of the risk that you have pointed to. Now, the only explanation I can come up with for the Russian strategy is that they're balancing out the risks and they've decided that going slow is less risky than going fast. They're trying to go fast risks 
things going badly wrong. That, you know, if you try and lunge towards, uh, you know, um, uh, Lviv, for example, from Belarus, then, you know, you could get your troops cut off, you could invite some great, some great disaster or something of that kind. So they've decided that they have to take it attritionally and slow. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that that's, um, you know, that that's their calculation. Now, I am sure that they are aware of all the concerns that you've highlighted. They understand that that does leave a political space for people in Washington, the neocons in Washington and in London and in Brussels to agitate for intervention. They undoubtedly know about the attempts to engineer regime change and color revolutions in Moscow and as you know, they've been talking a lot about that and about the kind of steps that they're taking. I mean, bear in mind, one of the other meetings Putin had this week, this week that's just passed, are uh, with the chiefs of the internal security agencies. He had a whole meeting with them. It was as big a speech as any of the others. And it was an interesting speech, too. We only got excerpts from it because obviously these are people who work in the shadows, if you like. But clearly the Russians are aware of all of this. But as I said, they have to make this, take out this balance of risks. And that's what they're doing. Now, the point is, the Russians calculate risks. They say, you know, this is more risky strategy than that strategy. And we're going to take them less risky strategy than the more risky one, because ultimately, you know, this is the better way for us. The trouble with the neocons, and this is comes back to your original point, is that the neocons don't think in the same way. Because for them, it's a zero-sum game. It's winner-takes-all. It's all or nothing. <laughs> so if it looks to you as a neocon that you're going to lose, then, of course, you, the risk is that you're going to gamble and gamble recklessly on something big that will turn things around fast. And it might be a reckless step, one that is unbelievably risky inherently, but it's something which, as a neocon, you might decide to do rather than admit to yourself that your great plan, your great strategy of knocking out Russia, breaking it up, and then closing in on China has failed. And that's the real that's the real threat in the world today. And, you know, one hopes that there are enough rational people left in Washington, in the Pentagon and such places, and that those people have enough institutional power to uh, slow this, you know, to, to act as a restraint when those calls for that reckless thing, that reckless decision um, come, which they will. I mean, sooner or later it's going to happen. Sooner or later, the neocons are going to dis demand something utterly reckless. Bear in mind that the Washington Post now admits that it wasn't, almost certainly wasn't Russia that was behind the Nord Stream uh, sabotage. So who was it? Well, clearly someone on the Western side. Clearly that must have been agreed by the neocons. Once upon a time, I would have said that was a reckless step. But you see, if you're prepared to take that kind of reckless step, where do you stop? Yeah, but my final point on all of this is is I, I, I agree with you, but the, the problem and the neocons, they never measure risk. No. It, it goes it goes to the heart of this Nord Stream article and, and the Washington Post admitting that it wasn't the Russians or they, they say they have sources that claim they're skeptical it was the Russians. That's how they worded it in Europe. It's that the neocons don't ever measure risk because they never face any repercussions for the terrible decisions they make. So they yeah. don't even think in those terms. They don't think yeah. if, if things go horribly wrong in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or by blowing up Nord Stream, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my power. Things are going to go badly for me and my and, and, and my buddies it's at Neocon uh, Central. They never think like that. Never. I agree. They, they actually I, get I promoted know. up. That's always been the next thing. So that's I, why I, for them, for them, blow up. 
Yeah, for, so for them, blow up Nord Stream, Washington Post pretty much admits that that we were behind it. No problem. It's not a big yeah. deal. Nothing's really? going to happen to us. Yeah, so no. yeah, Washington Post, go ahead and publish it. Actually, yeah, yeah. I prefer that you publish it so people know that we were the ones, at least they have an idea that we were the ones that are uh, running the show. I mean, they don't think in terms of, of, of uh, I may risk something because they never lose anything. No, no one ever takes anything away from them. No one takes their position. No one takes their salary. No one takes their think tank. No one. No one stops their funding. Or, 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 and they don't really get much political pushback either. No, I completely agree with everything that you've just said. I would go further, actually. Not only do they not calculate risk, they don't calculate resources. <laughs> they never acknowledge limits. I mean, if you read Neocon no. publications, which I've done many, many times, they never talk in those terms. They never talk about, you know, what weapons we are available, ammunition stocks, economic resources, industrial resources. That sort of thing doesn't really concern them in their universe. They assume a position of unlimited power, that they can do anything they want, and they act on it. And, you know, if things become ever more dangerous and ever more risky, well, as you rightly say, they've never had to face the consequences of that. And that's made them, frankly, well, that's taken away any worry about risk, any sense of calculation that, you know, they might once another in another universe have had. All I am saying is, and I come back to what I said, this is the trap they are leading the United States into. They've done this repeatedly. We've had, you know, if you, you, if you like, we've had dress rehearsals in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, in uh, um, all kinds of places, probably before long Yugoslavia as well, the Balkans. And <clears throat> now that dress rehearsal is ending. We are coming to the final play. In fact, the final act of that play. And the United States is not the same as the neocons. If this goes wrong, it will have very serious repercussions. And I'm not going to talk about those because we can all imagine how bad they can be. No, I mean, the, the only option to, to end this all is if... Someone somewhere somehow in the United States somehow says enough with these neocon guys. Yes. We need to dismantle this whole neocon project. Yes. Brick by I mean, brick just to dismantle the whole thing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, can I just say we did have something not unlike that in the 1960s. I mean, you know, there was very powerful they were called hawks in those days. It was hawks versus doves. They weren't called neocons. And they were never as powerful as the neocons are today. But, you know, there was eventually an acceptance within the um, political system of the United States that policy of endless confrontation, endless interference in all sorts of places around the world was leading the United States into a very dangerous place. And the United States shifted policy in the 60s. It pursued detente with the Soviet Union and it sought relations with China. So it's happened before. You know, those forces of reason have prevailed in the past. That doesn't unfortunately mean that they will prevail in the future. Their record of the last 30 years has not been good. Yeah. All right. We will end it there, the Duran.locals.com. Also look for us on Rockfin and go to the Duran shop 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.